Pay attention to the title of this episode. Shogun Episode 7 is named A Stick of Time. The owner of the local tea house, Gin, has a very important scene in this episode of Shogun. If the name of the episode is based off your scene, then you must be pretty important, right? So Gin's fairly innocuous scene is deserving of a second look, and I shall keep it in mind throughout this review. Tons of wheeling and dealing in this episode, with a twist that will surprise you, if you haven't read the books, nor seen the 1980s TV series. Blackthorn is confused about his role throughout this entire episode. There's a couple of weird editing choices, such as cuts instead of fades, where the fade would have shown that there was a period of time that we did not see. Minor quibbles, but you can't have an accurate review without bringing up any issues as you see them. I really enjoyed episode 7 of Shogun, A Stick of Time. I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 and waiting patiently for episode 8, so next Tuesday can hurry up and arrive. If anyone has a time machine, please let me know in the comments. My only major gripes are that the episode was a bit shorter than I would have liked, edging towards 50 minutes. Also, some potential storylines seem to have been raised and then abandoned. Maybe we could get the director's cut. Or perhaps I'm just reading things into the plot that aren't actually there. The show isn't here to serve my every whim. It's here to tell a story. And if the story doesn't go in the direction I'd like, that's my problem, not the show's. Another minor issue I have is that they will not translate certain words, which means that I have to pause to look it up. In one scene, Gin uses the term Eucharim. I had to look it up and find out it basically means prostitute. Why couldn't they just subtitle that? Or is there some subtle difference that can't be translated? Let's talk spoilers. Also, before we get into the spoilers, please do me a favour and hit that subscribe button. We have a lot of interesting shows coming up, including Fallout and Rebel Moon Part 2 that are sure to provide oodles of quality entertainment and I'd love to hear your opinions on these shows. I initially thought that we'd skipped a massive part of the story and had been transported to the aftermath of the upcoming battle. Thankfully, I was wrong. It's a flashback to Lord Toronaga's first battle. They really love their decapitated heads in Shogun. So Lord Toronaga won his first ever battle as a young boy, and the opposing general asks for him to second him as he commits Sudoku. Basically, lop off his head after he disembowels himself. Old mate strips out of his armour so quickly that I almost thought he was another person for a minute. It maybe could have used a slow fade instead of a cut to show the passage of time. There's a few weird cuts in this episode that make me think things are happening differently than what is actually being shown. Cut to present day and Toronaga is awaiting the arrival of his brother, Seiki Nobutatsu. Seiki says that on the way he spied a decimated army, and Toronaga mentions to Seiki that his army has been decimated. Keep this in mind when Gin's scene comes up later. Seiki has a sweet shark fin looking helmet on. He's a real pimp daddy. Seiki had me hook, line and sinker. I thought he and Toronaga were close friends. They seemed to be so at ease with each other. They had some pretty good bants between the two of them. Mariko has bartered down Gin's price for a week of Willow World in exchange for one stick of Toronaga's time. Toronaga shows his disdain for his brother, or half-brother, and even calls him a mongrel. Is he a mongrel because of his breeding or because of his actions? I wonder. The Toronaga-Blackthorn relationship seems to have become a little frosty as of late. Blackthorn's trying to work out where he stands, but Toronaga's back to treating him like a servant. A pity, really, as I thought they could become closer. Blackthorn tells Toronaga that he will serve him whatever fate may bring. Fate seems to be the theme in this episode. Omi is visiting the tea house in his Sunday best, but Kiku is busy servicing Seiki. Gin tells Omi that Blackthorn seemed to be more interested in Mariko than in Kiku. Hiramatsu brings Fuji her husband and son's ashes. She's still determined to join them in the afterlife once her six months are up. I thought she would have been growing to appreciate her new life, but I guess she's just putting on a face. Even Hiramatsu suggests that she could live on and enjoy the victory that they helped attain. Fuji isn't sure the battle will go in their favour. It seems all the women in this city have a death wish. I do like the little loving touch she gives to her son's ashes at the end of the scene. 
Poor old Nagakado, he just wants to make his father proud. It's not his fault he was raised as a sheltered life. If Toronaga wanted him to be raised as a warrior, he should have seen to it. He wants to get into battle because he hears it's better than your first time with a woman. Untaro doesn't want to hear such nonsense. And Yubishiki gives a cheeky, depends on the woman. You gotta love him. At the banquet, Seiki is telling bawdy tales about his family, while Mariko translates for Blackthorn. I like how Blackthorn drops some food and picks it up, and Buntaro looks on in disgust. Seiki's stories get more and more offensive until he tells a story about Toronaga soiling his pantaloons as a young child. Well, that's the end of that, and he reveals that he's been made a regent and that Toronaga is to report to Asaka, and also that Nagakato is to commit Sudoku for the murder of Josen. The disrespect he shows by throwing the papers at Hiramatsu will not go unpunished. All the roads in or out of Izu are now blocked by Seiki's men. Blackthorn wants to go get his ship and get out of there, but Mariko thinks it's a stupid idea. Not sure if she doesn't think it would work, or if it would be against the samurai code to flee. Seiki returns Yabaguchi, his general with the eye patches, head in a bucket. I guess now Yabushigi has no choice but to align himself with Toronaga. I've noticed Seiki doesn't really have a second in command, it's just him and his army. Does that mean if someone were to kill him, that the army would just fold under Toronaga's command? Here's the best scene in this episode. Lady Gin has her stick of time with Toronaga and proposes a red light district for his city of Edo. He dismisses it as a plan for someone who has a future as his fate has been decided. Gin tells him that fate is what you make it. She was born in a gutter and raised to be a prostitute. But she doesn't dwell on it, she uses it. Just as the ill that befell Toronaga, he has used to his benefit to become the man he is today. She shows she is observant by questioning why Toronaga left his decimated ranks visible to anyone to see. He must have done it for a reason, to lull his enemy into a false sense of security. Why else would a smart man leave himself so vulnerable? This goes full circle to say he's saying that, Do my eyes deceive me, or did I just see your decimated army in the last village? Why else meet with him in the path in the forest instead of in town? He was even expecting a grand welcome from the army. Toronaga's hiding his true power level. You can tell she got her message across because she was so attentive to her stick of time, but once she was done, she was all, yep, that's my time up, I'm out of here. Clever girl. This is a real puzzling scene. Why does Yabushigi take a bath in front of Seiki's men? Again, are they trying to lull them into a false sense of security, like, hey, I can go nude around you because I know you're not a threat. Nagakado and Omi are enjoying a bath and Seiki appears out of the shadows. Where was he? Just lurking in that cave? Nagakado questions Seiki's honour, but he says he's thinking of his legacy. Better than dying before you have time to create a legacy. Nagakado says if he has to die, at least it will be a beautiful death, but Seiki says that death is just a lonely path in the forest. I feel like Seiki is goading Nagakado into doing something stupid. Maybe he wants to eliminate any possible challenges to his legitimacy of rule. Blackthorn is standing on the shore looking at the ships when Yabushiki approaches and teases Blackthorn about his man being boiled alive. But Blackthorn can't speak Japanese, or can he? Blackthorn looks down at his sword and I take that as a threat, so Yabushiki tells him to draw. Yabs then proceeds to wipe the floor with him until Buntara appears out of nowhere with his blade at Blackthorn's throat. I guess he can't kill a Hatamoto because he leaves him be. My girl Fuji is training with her polearm, even though she's recovering from having her house collapse on her spine. Nagakado expresses his remorse for allowing Fuji's husband to defend his father from Ishido's insults. If he had said something instead, her husband and son would still be with her. She stifles a cute little sniffle and explains that we do what we can do. Nagakado looks like he's taken it to heart. I still don't understand the whole will situation. I would have thought that if you were a traitor, your property would be forfeit. 
but Torunaga is leaving some land to Gin for a tea house district, which is nice. Buntaro wants to cut Blackthorn's head off, claiming that he doesn't like the way he looks at his wife. Torunaga asks if she's encouraging him. If so, she should be killed too. But Buntaro just wants the engine's head. Torunaga refuses, as he should want both of them if there has been any real offence committed. Torunaga questions where Mariko's loyalties lie. To his cause of justice against the killers of her father, or to the barbarian. She just wants him to end it. Another weird editing choice here. After discussing how silly it was to have a child second during Sudoku, Hiramatsu teleports from in front of Torunaga to seated behind him. No idea why they didn't just have him walk to his seat. Torunaga agrees to go to Osaka. He says that Crimson Sky was a mistake. Doesn't mean he thinks any attack is a mistake. Just the full frontal assault. Maybe they can start their attack from within the walls of the castle. Blackthorn gets up and acknowledges Yabushiki and Nagakado. Both members of his cannon regiment? Is that a sign? I did find it odd that no one really objected when he got up, with the exception of Bontaro, but he's itching to kill him. It's gotta be a ploy. Make Seiki think that a rift has formed? Surely. When they first welcomed Seiki, Toronaga even said that Anjan's cannon tactics were crucial to his cause. Cut to Seiki giving Kiku a royal pillowing. Looks like she's giving him the old asphyxi wank. When she said she was going to break out the top shelf toys, I thought Kiku was going to be the one to off him. I like how they show how entangling his dressing gown is. Foreshadowing. Turns out Kiku left so that Nagakado could make an attempt on Seiki's life. But he instead slips on the wet dressing gown and cracks his head open like an overripe watermelon. Seiki makes a neat little callback to the scene at the hot springs and questions where the beauty is in Nagakado's death. Surely there will be retribution against Kiku and Gin for facilitating this attack on a regent. Ooh, silent credits with nothing but the sound of falling rain. How classy. So ends episode 7 of Shogun, Stick of Time. An episode worthy of a 9 out of 10 if ever there was one. Great plot, lots of intrigue, a real sense of foreboding as Toronaga decides his next course of action in the face of an almost insurmountable obstacle. A nice little change of pace from the more subdued episode last week, which had more scheming from Lady Achiba. We get to see the importance of the courtesans in full in this episode. Their access to important men makes them useful sources of knowledge as well as an opportunity to catch them with their guard down. We've seen very little of the Portuguese, so I'm assuming they'll come into play again with their hold on the two Christian regents, as well as their own army of Ronan. Blackthorn also has his ship and crew in Edo if he can make it. I can't wait until next week. I need to know what happens next. Surely Lord Toronaga has a plan. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie. Thanks for your time, and have a good one.